Today we are honored to not only have you here, but to uh, have Jan Babiak here today as an honoree in a series that we call the Heroes of Business. Uh, we've had quite an outstanding uh, list of heroes of business over the last uh, five or so years, and I'm telling you, you're in for quite a treat today. Jan just spoke in chapel uh, with our uh, business students and our combined women's chapel, and she did the best job, I thought, of anyone who has spoken in this entire <laughs> series. So I'll save the introductions until after lunch. I am delighted first this morning to insert a, an addition to the program. Dr. Randy Lowry was able to catch an early flight this morning from someplace north and someplace cold, I think. <laughs> But we're delighted that he was able to, uh, to get back in time to welcome you. So will you join me in welcoming Dr. Randy Lowry? Well, good morning. There's about eight inches of snow in Detroit. Uh, it's about 30 degrees colder. And uh, I guess the new thing in Michigan is they don't bother to plow the roads. Fascinating moment. When you drive almost 100 miles on the interstate and eight inches of snow and no one has plowed it. Isn't that amazing? I think I counted about 60 or so semis off the road uh, in that journey. So I really am, Jan. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and, and we're glad that you're here. And uh, the relationship is obviously the important part. But uh, sometimes uh, it's just good to be uh, where you are. Uh, let me welcome all of you. And uh, thank you for coming to this moment in Lipscomb University's uh, dynamic history. Uh, we are thrilled to be a university that's serving our community and connecting with our community, and you all help us make that possible. Uh, one time someone said, and I think it's very, very true, that the people you really want to be interested in are the people who are willing to claim your institution. And claiming can come in a whole lot of ways. Claiming, obviously, for presidents uh, sometimes comes in terms of money. Uh, but in terms of deans, it comes in terms of, of people who will see the work that's going on in a college and, and want to be a part of it. And Jan, you are claiming us today with your presence here. Uh, you're claiming us with the expertise you'll bring, the model you will be, especially to women in business, and, and we appreciate that uh, so very much. And we hope we're worthy of that claiming, because when it goes the other way, uh, we want uh, our students to leave this institution uh, and to be claimed by companies throughout Middle Tennessee and the nation, be claimed by them uh, for their talent and also the character they bring to the workplace. Not long ago, we had a speaker on campus, and he was speaking to a group of uh, our senior administrators, and he said something that really kind of caught me off guard, and I, and I didn't know how to react to it. And, and I want to share it with you. Uh, he uh, was looking at us, and as the CEO of a very prominent Nashville corporation, he said this. He said, you know, I'm tired of hiring the smartest kids in the world. Boy, I didn't know how to respond. I mean, I think Lipscomb folks are okay. I mean, they're bright. I mean, is he, I couldn't figure out where that was going. He said, I'm really tired of hiring the smartest kids in the world, but he said, I'll hire every single Lipscomb graduate you sent me. And I thought, hmm, there must be something else here. <laughs> and uh, so afterwards, I said, fill me in, help me understand. Uh, and he was going exactly where you would imagine. Uh, he wants someone who has the competence to do the work his corporation has to get done. But he also wants someone who can bring a sense of character to the workplace and a sense of values, a sense of morality, a sense of uh, something else because it's the package that is so very, very meaningful. And for him, at least, it's so very, very productive. So thank you for claiming us. Thank you for claiming our graduates. Thank you for being a part of today as we celebrate Jan and her career and the work that she is still doing. God bless you all. Well, let me welcome you to the campus and to this Heroes of Business luncheon. Uh, we are delighted to have each of you. We're particularly glad to have all of the women business leaders who are here today. Ladies, thank you all for being here. I know you're here to uh, join us in congratulating and welcoming uh, Jan to the campus. We're 
delighted to have all of you. And if I start naming VIPs in the room, I'll, I'll take all of Jan's time. But I do want to recognize Susan Huggins, who's the CEO of Cable. Susan, welcome to, to the campus. And a Lipscomb alum. Yeah, that's right. And a Lipscomb alum. So we're delighted to have you. And you actually graduated from Linda Shack's program. And Linda's on the program later, later in the afternoon. So we're uh, thrilled that we are able to have this program called Heroes of Business as part of our College of Business co-curriculum. Now everybody knows what a curriculum is. All colleges of business teach accounting and marketing and management, all of the academic disciplines. But we add to that a tradition of 123 years of developing business leaders who embrace the values and virtues of Jesus. And the way we develop those business leaders is not only through the academic curriculum, but through our co-curriculum. The co-curriculum is all of the things that students do while they're with us during that four years, or in the case of our graduate students, two years, that they absorb at the most impressionable time of their lives and then use to guide their lives for the rest of their lives. We've been doing this for 123 years now, and I am pleased to tell you that in this one community, there are more than 15,000 living alums of Lipscomb University. Worldwide, there are about 40,000. But you'd be hard pressed in Nashville to find a business of any significance that doesn't have a leader in many cases, the CEO or the CFO who graduated from Lipscomb University and perhaps from the College of Business. Of those 40,000 living alums worldwide, about 20% graduated with business degrees from Lipscomb. And so we're really thrilled to be able to put into practice our mission statement of developing business leaders who embrace the values and virtues of Jesus. And I can't think of anyone who embodies that better than Jan Babiak. Her bio is in the program. I won't take your time or her podium time to uh, repeat all of that. She was a managing director at Ernst & Young, lived in the UK for 20 years, rose to the highest levels of that organization, now serves on the boards of three very large corporations, Walgreens, the Bank of Montreal, which I believe is a $550 billion organization based in Toronto. And I think the most interesting board seat you have, Jan, is the uh, Postal Service in the United Kingdom. And so I really sort of wish the post office would put you on their board here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could figure out how to get the loss under a billion dollars a year, but not by raising the price of stamps anymore. Jan has distinguished herself in so many ways. One of the ways she's distinguished herself is in her marriage. She and Brian, who is here with us today, have been married for 33 years. 33 years, will you? Brian, stand up. They were married on December 31st, 1980, if I remember right. Yes. And uh, so that's quite an accomplishment. For him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure both of you have, uh, have enjoyed each other's company for all of those years. Brian is a cyclist as well as a fashion merchandiser and lives with Jan on her farm in Leaper's Fork. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I'll save the stories about how she and Brian came to move from the United Kingdom to Leaper's Fork, Tennessee. That's quite a, quite a change. In fact, I've got the name of your biography. I think it should be something like From Hyde Park to Puckett's Grocery. There you go. I, there you go. I think that would be a good title for you. You give me a royalty on that. I'll do that. You write that. So will you join me in uh, welcoming Jan Babiak. I'm here just a minute. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. 
Yeah. Now, we presented the Heroes of Business Award, which you see to my left here uh, in chapel. We won't present that again, but I uh, would ask you, if you have a chance before you leave, come by and see that. It's inscribed very nicely, and we're delighted that we were able to, to do that. Jan and I are going to talk. We're going to have a conversation now. I really wish I had agreed to do this a little differently, though, because when Jan made her presentation in chapel, she made about a 15-minute uh, speech, and she absolutely knocked it out of the park. And so I, I really kind of wish that I had, had left you to do that. I'd like you to add anything you'd like to what I've said. Thank you for being here today, and then I'll take my place, and you can join me in just a moment. And so, so thank you so much. Well, the, the main thing I want to say is thank you very, very much for this inexplicable honor. Um, I said this morning that when um, I came to lunch here last um, summer and the dean had me in a room that, not intimidating at all, had pictures of all of the previous ones, you know, people who are curing cancer and have got Cy Young awards and things like that. And then he said, and how would you like to join their ranks? And I said to myself, this must be what a donkey feels like when asked to run the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of I still feel that way, but I, as I, again, as I said this morning, the thing that made me realize was it wasn't really about me, it was about the teams that I've had the pleasure to work with. And I'm so thrilled today to see so many, of, particularly the women in Nashville who have just <clears throat> embraced me and lifted me up um, every day since I got here, and I mean literally every day since I got here. When Brian and I arrived, it was on a uh, December's Eve, uh, and I went straight into an International Women's Forum meeting because I was in the London chapter, and I left Brian with nine bags and put him in a rental car and sent him to Leaper's Fork, which I think scared the taxi driver more than anything. <laughs> and I took the rental car, and I literally met the great women of the city at this time. And to see so many of you here today, I'm just honored beyond all measure. And, and you know, I think the men are great, too. And <laughs> <laughs> but it has been the women that have really uh, lifted me up, and I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for particularly the ones who nominated me to, to wear this saddle today in this race. So, thank you, Jan. Thank you. So, Jan, let's start with... Uh, the, the talk that you make quite often is entitled From the Trailer Park to the Boardroom. And I'm really intrigued by that, as I'm sure many of the other people in the audience are. So tell us a little bit about your journey, apparently from a trailer park to a boardroom. Um, actually, lots of trailers, uh, <laughs> lots of parks. Um, I believe there's a song right now that says, you know, same trailer, different park. And, uh, you know, I, I think I moved four times before I was age four, but I always said the same bedroom. Uh, which is kind of nice. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a it's a funny thing. Actually, the um, I think the real journey from the trailer park to the boardroom was actually very recent because um, I was at a event where I, I wasn't the, the the featured person with pictures everywhere, as is the case here. I was on a panel with a group of um, quite stellar women, quite quite amazing women. And we were at a university campus, and we had been talking about, you know, making it in business and all. And one of the women in the audience who was a student stood up, and, you know, she was a really forthright kind of, you know, kind of tough girl, you know. And she kind of said, yeah, that's all well and good for you lot. You know, you grow up affluent and you end up in these places. And, you know, I, up till that point, and, and literally this was just maybe three, four years ago, I had never talked to anyone about my background. Probably the only person that really knew about it was Brian, because um, I kind of hid that. Because you know, people are really judgmental of the poor more, more than just about anything. And in fact, I worked really hard to make sure that Brian didn't meet anyone in my family until the wedding. And sadly, <laughs> my my brother, um, who worked the oil fields of Oklahoma, was in an industrial accident nine days before our wedding. So he got to meet them all in the emergency room when they were crazy. <laughs> so, so really good. But, but in any event, so when this woman stood up, I just all this righteous indignation rose up to me, and I said, "Excuse me." I said, "I grew up in the trailer parks. You can't tell me I grew up affluent." And the biggest shock 
the, the first biggest shock was that I said that out loud. <laughs> and the second was the other three women who had known me for decades went, <laughs> Nobody had a clue. And so I think my journey is actually in some ways just starting because what happened afterwards was these amazing women I was with huddled around me and said, why don't you talk about this? And I'm like, because I don't want people judging me for where I came from. And they said, yes, but it's, it's actually inspirational to others and to whom much is given, much is expected. And as a result of that, I began to talk about it. So it's still a little difficult, but. We, uh, when we wrote the bio and borrowed from your uh, resume that you sent us, we, we emphasized your Ernst & Young background. Mm -hmm. But I think I underestimated your entrepreneurial background. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell our audience a little bit about uh, the age at which you decided to go into business and uh, what your first business was, and then tell a little bit about the progression. OK. Um, I started my first business when I was seven. And um, it was partly because of the fact that um, in at school, the, you know, you, you, I don't know if they still do, but back in those days, you kind of had your school pictures taken. And then you had to bring your money in to pay for them. And, you know, it must have been like 75 cents or something at that point. And um, we didn't have the money for such luxuries as pictures. And so every day I would come to school and the teacher would say, where's your money? You know, why haven't you brought your money in? And I was just, you know, I was horrified, you know, because it was so embarrassing to be pulled out. And, and I mean, it was embarrassing. And so I knew that my parents didn't have it. And so I had to figure out a way to pay for these pictures. Not because I really cared about the pictures, but, but I, was, I, I did care about being humiliated. So I set about figuring out how to get this money. And so one of my neighbors had a comic book. Well, they weren't allowed in our house. My family was seriously Southern Baptist, and those are evil. Um, so, um, <laughs> but they, in the back of it, it had this thing where you could buy um, flower packets. And the flower packets cost a nickel. And then you could um, sell them for a dime. And so I collected pop bottles, because back in those days, pop bottles had a, you know, they were two cents or something like that. And I guess my venture capital was my grandmother giving me a two cent stamp so I could mail <laughs> off to request it. Uh, and I think she made me pay her back. <laughs> but, uh, but I, so I sold those, and then I got the money, and uh, I reinvested, and I reinvested, and reinvested. And by the end of the year, I had, or not by the end of the year, but, you know, within a few weeks, I had enough money to uh, pay for the pictures. And I also had a newfound understanding of the fact that if I um, did a bit of hard work and came up with some ideas, then I could create businesses. So I continued on, and uh, as I said this morning, uh, by the time I was 11, I had a business where I had employees, uh, school children. Uh, I would sell um, babysitting, lawn mowing, flower planting services. Um, and then I would um, make sure the kids showed up, and I make sure they did a good job, and I would take 10% of the fee, and I could then <laughs> leverage myself across. But by the time I was 14, I realized that children are really, really not good employees. <laughs> they, they like, don't show up. They get grounded. There's all kinds of problems. So by the time I was 14, I uh, was going into uh, food service and all, because they didn't really check your age at that point. Point. I, I did pretty good. Dunkin' Donuts, the first place I worked, they called one day and told me that I needed to drive somewhere, and I had to explain that I couldn't. And they told me I needed a driver's license, and I explained that that was going to be a bit difficult. Um, and so they fired me. <laughs> so I went down the road and went to work for Solo and Suck Aid, and they didn't find out I was 16 until after I had my birthday party. And then it's all good. We tried to assure our students in chapel this morning that this hero of business that we present the heroes of business as paragons of virtue, you know. And uh, Jan shows up and makes her speech and pleads guilty to violating the child labor laws. So we tried to assure the students that it really wasn't Jan that was guilty, that it was the employer that was guilty. Well, I would have been guilty of a sin of omission. Because, you know, I just, you know. So Jan, you, uh, you rose to very senior level at Ernst & Young. You ran a number of different types of businesses within the European markets uh, based in London. One of the businesses you ran for UK was the IT security business, mm -hmm. I think, uh, based in the UK. Now, we've all heard a lot in the last few weeks, last couple of months, about IT security, first with the Edward Snowden 
mm -hmm. disclosures, the NSA, and then over Christmas with the Target uh, uh, issues with the credit cards. So talk to us a little bit about your view of IT security in this new world that we've all found ourselves in. We all have dozens of apps on our phones and we give our credit cards out without even thinking twice about mm -hmm. it. So where, where are we headed with all that? Well, it's just, I, um, I, I was actually the founder of the practice on, client, on um, security in the UK and also across um, Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa. So I spent a lot of time working in India um, as well as Africa and Middle East in this area. And it's, um, you know, it's something that companies for such a long time really didn't take seriously. You know, we would go in, I had an attack and penetration team, um, a white hat hackers that would hack in and um, I can tell you that there was not a single bank that we weren't able to hack into usually within minutes mm. usually within minutes literally and you know we used combinations of technical hacking as well as social engineering um, you know one of my favorite social engineering I had an absolutely stunning young woman that worked for me she could get past any security guard in London <laughs> and, and it got even better when she got pregnant because then she, all she had to do was say I really have to go to the bathroom and they'd let her right through it <laughs> and you know we would go in we'd put you know little key uh, collectors you know between the back of the key, and we did, we did all kinds of things and the interesting thing was was we would tell companies you know look this this is how long it took my team to hack through other people can do this and for a very long time they would it just wasn't priority and then um, one of the things that you know is is um, you know we get a lot of bad press about is Sarbanes-Oxley but when Sarbanes-Oxley came through and CFOs and CEOs had to sign a piece of paper that said that their internal controls were good that's when we really started making progress in terms of securing systems and What's happened though is is the criminals are also making progress, and you know it requires a you know constant vigilance, and it requires not a system to uh, stop access, but it requires a system to make sure that you know about access and that you can shut it down. And, you know what happened with Target? You know they had what's called black POS, uh, where the, and they had an open system, and so they. Um, the people who hacked were dropping things in different places around, and then when they were ready to take their attack, they had almost like sleeper cells, if you would, that allowed them through. And you know, so what you need to be doing is not reacting, but proactively, you know, running war games and things like that. And as individuals, you need to really, you know, just like everything else, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I travel a lot, and I don't let my handbag out of my sight. Yeah, think about you know the things that you have electronically as being things you need to look at as well. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is you know read a good life so you don't have anything to hide, and that's all good. <laughs> now we have uh, a number of outstanding uh, female business leaders here with us today, and you certainly are at the head of the class. You serve on three of the largest company boards in the world, actually. And, and looking for a fourth, just so you. Oh. Know. <laughs> so and any, what have I told you guys? Any. <laughs> I, the, the, this is an outstanding table of women here who've just completed the Corporate Board Academy. I told them every time you get a chance, tell somebody you're looking for a board. And every one of them is. Okay. And so just, just had a little teaching moment and there. And so if there are any nom gov chairs here, we've got a whole table full of candidates and yes. Jan would take another seat if, if asked. So, But tell us a little bit about the emergence of women in the boardrooms. Uh, we, each year, uh, our College of Business prepares a study of the number of women on corporate boards. And thank and, you for doing well, that. Well, we do that in partnership with Cable, Susan, and we're delighted to be a partner in that. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. And it is interesting that over the last few years, the number of women sitting on boards in Tennessee has risen, but it's still overwhelmingly male dominated. And bottom quartile relative to the rest of the U.S. So tell us where, where U.S. boards are headed and tell us why it's important for boards to be diversified. Well, I think diversified is exactly the right point. Uh, women are just part of that dimension because you need a board that represents the um, your customer base. And all. Uh, one of my first boards was called Logica. It was an IT company in uh, the United Kingdom. S did IT services in 40 countries. That board had eight people on it. It had um, a, um, a Frenchman, it had an Italian, it had a, a, a Brit, it had an American, it had a German, it had an Indian. Um, so out of the eight, we had very little duplication. We had somebody who was the CEO of a hardware company, someone who had been the CEO of a software company, someone who had been in one of the big four firms who understood accounting and big contracts. We, you know, 
and we happen to have 25% uh, women and uh, a, 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 an Indian, all this. That was true diversity, and with that, you don't get groupthink. You know, if a great minds think alike, if you have nine, C, you know, white male CEO sitting in a room, you got, you, you know, you've got a lot of redundancies. You know, so you need to make sure that you bring a good mix. And if you've got a customer base, a supplier base, you know, that has women in it, why on earth would you not have people in the room who understood your customers and what you're trying to do? Because there, there is no excuse because there are more than enough really qualified and talented women to fill those positions. Jen, I, I was just really distressed over the holidays as I followed the news about J.P. Morgan Chase settling the SEC charges. Hmm. My memory is that they paid a fine, I think, of $13 billion. Hmm. It's, almost, it's almost beyond our imaginations as individuals to even conceive of anything like that. And then they turned right around and settled some other charges and paid more. And then the board met and gave the CEO a raise. And I was just flabbergasted. I'm sure Jamie Dimon is one of the better CEOs in this country in a lot of ways, but in that particular way, he didn't lead very effectively. So tell us where we're headed in this country from your view inside the boardroom. What's, what's wrong with the board rooms of America? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to get a fourth board if I answer that question. <laughs> Other than a lot of males. Okay. okay. Um, Might I talk about that from a slightly different perspective? Sure. Because having lived and worked in the United Kingdom and in Europe for the um, last quarter of a century, um, one of the things that's interesting is, is in Europe we have separate independent chairman and, um, and, and CEO. It's not the same role. And I think most of the rest of the world views that as a very good governance model. There was a huge amount of debate around Mr. Diamond and what was going on and whether or not you should have a chairman and a CEO because, and there's so much misunderstanding in the U.S. about that particular dimension because in, it's not, they, I, I hear Americans say things like, well, who's in charge then? Well, the reality is the chairmen know what their job is and, you know, in, it used to be the same in the U.K. and they went to a comply or explain basis and it, and it shifted in a very short period of time. But chairman run the, the board. They don't run the company. The CEO runs the company. And he report or she reports to the board who has oversight of that. And we also have a, 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 um, what's called a senior independent director, or CID, who makes sure that everyone is having oversight of the chairman. So it's kind of the three parts of governance, as the US should be familiar mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. In the US, we still have too many environments where you've, everything rests with one individual. And sometimes that works fine. But you need checks and balances. Mm. And I think what we're going to see in the US, um, for both the good and the bad of that, is that there's a lot more pressure to divide these all powerful roles so that there are some checks and balances. Should that be legislated? You know, um, I always hate legislation, particularly Americans were very good at figuring out how to get around re legislation. Mm. You know, Enron was a good example of that, uh, where you know, a lot of what was being done was perfectly legal at that time. Mm. Um, in, again, in the UK and many other countries, we have something called Comply or Explain, which lays out good governance guidelines. And if you don't adhere, you need to explain why not. And so when it came down to uh, probably about 15 years ago, combining or separating the CEO and the chairman role, it was Comply or Explain. And very quickly, there became no justification. What were you going to say that, you know, this person was so great that nobody could have oversight? Well, that doesn't make sense. Mm. And over time, eventually, all of the FTSE 350 moved to separate roles. And that's one of the things, uh, coming back to the issue about women, because there are some countries that have moved to quotas. Um, I'm not a big fan of quotas, although I do believe that it doesn't necessarily mean you get incompetent because there are so many qualified women who aren't on boards that, that should be. But if you have a complier explain, I just can't wait to hear what the explanation is because it can't be because there aren't great women out there. Mm -hmm. You know, we won't we won't have true equality in the workplace till we have just as many incompetent women leading as we have <laughs> incompetent men. <laughs> <laughs> if we have any reporters in the room, we <laughs> we <laughs> we may want to ask for editing privileges. <laughs> On that, well, we're, the clock on the wall says we're okay. going to run out of time, especially if we're going to save Linda a few minutes to Please pay tribute. <laughs> no, we want to give you time, but I, I do want to just, in closing, ask about your move from London to Tennessee. Now, Brian has told me that you all lived in a 1,900 square foot 
uh, flat, I think, in, in London, and you moved to 19 acres in uh, Leaper's Fork. And Brian, I understand you cut the grass, or <laughs> at least pick supervise it. Pick up sticks, <laughs> pick up sticks. And Stacy told me that you were looking out the window with her the other day and you saw a bobcat. Well, yeah. So that's a little different than Hyde Park, no doubt about that. But uh, I also understand that you literally picked Nashville by sticking a pin on a map. Or, oh, or something close to it. Tell us about how you chose Leapers Fork. How in the world did you come to Nashville? Well, anyone who knows me knows I would never allow something so random to, put to make such a big decision. <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, come on. Look, what color am I wearing today? Too? Purple. <laughs> did everybody notice that? <laughs> Every Everything, everything is planned. Stacy told me you were a micromanager, but I had no idea. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Stacy. She didn't tell me she that. Didn't. I concluded it on my own. What can I say? <laughs> All right, so how did you come from Stacey's London? Stacy is my new executive assistant. <laughs> so we want to make her happy. Um, so we actually, um, I, once I decided to leave an absolutely wonderful career at Ernst Young, and I'm grateful for all the Ernst and Young uh, people who are and al alumni also from that, because it was a wonderful nearly three decades. But once I decided to leave, um, I knew that, that, I mean, I sat down and thought about options, one of which was to be an entrepreneur, another one was to go be CEO of a tech company, or, or potentially go on boards, in which I decided to build a board portfolio. Um, that was plan A. I had a B, C, and D, which I fortunately didn't have to go to, but they would have been fine too. But in doing that, I, Brian and I were trying to think about where we wanted to live because London is really expensive. I mean, it's $10 a gallon for gas, you know, and 19,000 square feet. Let me tell you, we sold it and bought 19 acres and built a big old house in Leapers Fort and still put money in the bank because, <laughs> you know, it is expensive living in London. So sure. where do you want to live? And so we were going to move where our friends were, but 20 years living abroad, they're everywhere. I mean, you know, they're in 10 countries, you know, they're in 30 states. So then it was a matter of what's important to us, and we identified six criteria, and we started an internet search looking for what those were. And then, and we had never been to Tennessee at all, and we started telling all of our British friends we thought we would move to Tennessee, and they were like, oh, you can't possibly move there. <laughs> bunch, of, bunch of hillbillies, you know. <laughs> You're like, well, well I, th I think I can. And so we started visiting and looking, and, and this area matched the criteria. And the, the uh, committee of 200 members, who are another great uh, senior women's uh, group, uh, Nancy Peterson and Cordy Harrington, and all just embraced me and said, You got to come here. Or, You got to come here. <laughs> you know, and so, so we uh, visited and just found it just the most welcoming and wonderful and cosmopolitan. Because everybody also said, once you've lived abroad, you come back to the U.S., everybody's kind of parochial. But you got the music industry here, you know, so everybody else has been to Paris. And so they don't look at you as if you're pretentious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's just been a wonderful, I mean, it just. It, it, my biggest problem is there's so much, is there's so many invitations to get involved in some of these things that I sometimes need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Join me in congratulating Jan Babbitt. Thank you. Thank you. And Jan didn't tell you that the seventh criteria was that the place had to be across the street from Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. <laughs> but now they put their place on the market. So, hey, we're uh, delighted to uh, have Linda Schacht here also today. Linda is a close friend of uh, Jan's. Linda, of course, is the founding director of the Nelson and Sue Andrews Institute for Civic Leadership. And if there was anyone who promoted the role of women and equality in all regards in Nashville, it was Nelson Andrews. And so, Linda, thank you so much for coming. And would you say a few words about your friend? I'm not quite sure how to follow that. Um, and I wish now I had said, turn and put me on before Jan spoke. Uh, this really is, a, it says a tribute from a friend. It's really an appreciation from all your friends. And so many of them are here today that I feel as if I should just acknowledge them first. And that is 
I'll say to you that right after the speech that Jan gave this morning, there were 15 young women who surrounded her wanting to know more about what to do as they moved into the business world and wanted to be people of integrity like you. And so they saw firsthand what so many of the women in this room have seen and benefited from in both your life and the help you've given us. And I just want to acknowledge this group right here, which we've already said is the first class of the corporate uh, board academy that Cable created. And there's a reason I think that I was asked to do this because I met Jan really uh, because I had been lured into Cable uh, by Susan Huggins and all of the women who are sitting at that table back there who have built Cable in the last few years into even more than the mentoring uh, uh, organization that it's been for the last 35 years. And I want to acknowledge Donna Yurden and Yolanda Harris-Jackson, the two leaders, both the current president and incoming president, who are really taking Cable to a new level with the help of Jan. And that's how I first met Jan, because we began to look at what can we do with the Women on Corporate Boards Initiative of Cable. And so, Jan, here's what I think you did. You gave the vowels, Jan's vowels this morning, and I decided to do Linda's consonants. And don't worry, I'm not going to do the entire alphabet. Okay? I'm just going to do a few. For Jan, I'm just going to do the consonants that come right after Jan's vowels. So right after A is B. Thank you for being a bold innovator and coming up with the idea of the Corporate Board Academy. And what comes after E is F, fierce advocate, and also a fiercely candid friend. Does everybody in the room agree with that? Yeah, great. Um, what comes after I? J, joyous. Joyous not only in life and your life with Brian, but also joyous in the success of others. And I think that's what so many of us appreciate about you. What comes after O? P, patient patient with us, a patient supporter. Uh, okay, patient with Brian too. <laughs> what comes after you? Am I getting feedback? What comes after you? Wise, wise counselor. And no, I said I was only going to do those, but I got two more. One is C, a connector. The most amazing thing about Jan is some people will say, oh, yeah, well, I'll connect you with that person. And then you wait, and you might have to call back or whatever. With Jan, she gets home. She not only has sent the email to you about who the person is, but she sent an email to you and that person together saying, I'm connecting you. And I really appreciate that, and I know everybody in this room does, too. She's also connected me to friends I hadn't heard from in 20 years that I knew at Coca-Cola that she later got to know in London. And the last is L. She lifts us up. I really think of Jan as a talent scout and an agent. And she's done it all through her life. Some of you have seen the, sculpt, the sculpture in her house of she and Brian dancing at their 25th anniversary. And that's evidence of the way she finds talent and builds it up. Because they met that sculptor on a cruise and followed his career and lifted him up to the point that when they had their 25th anniversary, the gift they got was one of his sculptures of them dancing. At, at their anniversary. She did it for us in, in uh, the Tennessee Women's Forum, International Women's Forum, Tennessee chapter, when she was sitting on a plane and just learned that the coach, the, uh, coach for the women's boxing team in the Olympics lived in Nashville. None of us knew that. But she heard about it on a, on a plane, and before we knew it, we were hearing from this woman about lessons we can learn as leaders from boxers, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, all of you know how much I appreciate Esther, and, uh, and I'm going to close with the story of Esther, but not before I say to you, didn't Lisa Shacklett do a great job when she came to me and said, let's go to Turney and suggest Jan Babiak as a hero of business. So where's Lisa? Lisa, by the way, is a finalist for Women of Influence this year, so let's all pull for her. 
So finally, the story of Esther. You know, Esther was a reluctant leader. You know, when she was urged to go to the king and save her people, she, she said, I, well, I don't want to do that. And what was she asked? She was asked, how do you know that it was not for just such a time as this that you were put in the king's court to save your people? And I think that Jan asks us that every day when she pushes us. How do you know that it wasn't for just such a time as this, as this that you should use your talents, that you should be bold, that you should, you should shoot for the moon? And so Esther could have learned something from Jan, and all of us have too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jan, it's been a fabulous day. Thank you so much. Brian, thank you for joining us also. And to each of you, thank you for being here. This series has been one of the best things we've done in the College of Business. We've enjoyed so much, so many outstanding people who have been a part of the series, and certainly you lead the class. And so thank you. Thank you for that. And to each of you for making time in your busy schedules today for this lunch, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your friendship to Lipscomb University and to all of us, and I wish you nothing but the best for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.